And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining for today's Tuesday topics, and I call it death threats, acute adrenal crisis in the ICU. Very similar to some of the other endocrine dysfunctions that we see and that we talk about a lot, because uh, endocrine is something that we don't really think about very much. As bedside providers, we think a lot about hyperglycemia and controlling <laughs> our patient's glucose and protecting them from hypoglycemia, but we don't really talk very much about the other endocrine potentials when we're evaluating or caring for our critically ill patients. So today's talk is really going to be about the adrenal gland. And the first three slides, if you've been with me, you've seen them before, which is to always remember that at some point you will recognize that you have a patient who is in an acute endocrine emergency. Typically for us, it's about hyper or hypoglycemia, but it can also be, of course, about thyroid storm or severe hypothyroidism. And in addition to that, looking at primarily looking at adrenal insufficiency that is actually causative and causal in critical illness. And that's a really important perspective. Sometimes you don't recognize it at the time. You don't always know that it's there, but the care for that patient, the evaluation, the integration of therapy and the replacement of their endocrine function can really make the difference between life and death. And that's why we come together. So always really important to remember that just at the very, very most basic baseline, very important to remember that endocrinology is about diseases that have too much hormone or too little hormone. And testing has to be very dynamic. If the hormone is too high, suppress it. If the hormone is too low, stimulate it. And those are some very basic strategies when we're thinking about endocrinology and the presence of endocrine abnormalities in our critical patients. So today, uh, last week we talked about the thyroid hormone, but today what we're really gonna talk about is ACTH, uh, the pituitary hormone, adrenocorticotropin stimulating hormone. This is what but stimulates your adrenal glands. And your adrenal glands release four really, really profoundly important hormones or neurotransmitters. Now, just think about that. Our adrenal glands, so hi, my friends, if you don't mind, if you've just joined, would you please mute yourself? I'd appreciate it so much. Thank you. So just remind yourself, the adrenal glands release cortisol and aldosterone. So one is a glucocorticoid, the other is a mineral corticoid, but the adrenal glands are also profoundly instrumental in the release of your neurotransmitters. And neurotransmitters are what actually uptake sympathetic activity and then stimulate the receptor site of, of uh, your arteries, your veins, your myocardium, your sinus node. So really thinking about embracing this idea, and I think most particularly in patients with refractory hypotension, we really have to come back and focus and center our, our, our critical analysis on the adrenal gland because the adrenal gland is that organ that keeps us smoothly responsive to our sympathetic nervous system. And it also promotes very significantly control of salt and water and also vascular tone. So that's why we're going to look at this really important criteria. Now, when we think about control of vascular tone, we're always monitoring this. We're always evaluating it because we look at a subset of vascular tone, and that would be blood pressure. We remind ourselves that our blood pressure primarily is controlled through uh, regulation of uh, baroreceptors communicating uh, into the center of the brain through the hypothalamus, through the medulla oblongata, and sending out nervous system stimulation for us in this case, what we're talking about is primarily through the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. Remember, there is that other division, parasympathetic, but we're really thinking about the sympathetic division. That sympathetic division is activated at the receptor site through the uptake of the neurotransmitter. And the number one neurotransmitter that activates arterial constriction, of course, is norepinephrine, but we also see that with epinephrine. Now, both of these are from the adrenal medulla. 
So you may not be looking, and most of us are not looking unless we're doing research. We're not looking at circulating norepinephrine or pre-norepinephrine. We're not looking at circulating epinephrine, but instead we're looking at hypotension. And after we've done some basic volume resuscitation, we start to initiate replacement of our neurotransmitters. Now, as soon as you are thinking you need to replace a neurotransmitter, that means you're putting a patient on norepinephrine because they're hypotensive. You're putting a patient on epinephrine because they're hypotensive. You're putting them on both because they're hypotensive. As soon as you are adding neurotransmitters, you are basically assuming that the patient doesn't have adequate neurotransmitters. So you are basically replacing the adrenal output by adding norepinephrine and or epinephrine, which means you should also be thinking about the two other really important components of the adrenal gland, and that would be cortisol and aldosterone. Now we're gonna look at some things, we're gonna talk about some things that will give us a spearhead that says, you need to be looking at this right now, but I think it's also really important right at the outset, as you are replacing your patient's stores of neurotransmitters by administering and titrating up on norepinephrine, by administering and titrating up on epinephrine, you should be considering at that point that the patient may have some significant adrenal insufficiency. No, they didn't come into your unit with Addison's disease, a known adrenal insufficiency. This is critical illness adrenal insufficiency. And many of our patients actually present with this, unbeknownst to us and probably unevaluated by us. So again, always reminding ourselves that the center of the brain, the medulla oblongata, which is the connection from the hypothalamus and the pituitary into the spinal column, is actually stimulated and regulated by baroreceptors responding to volume and pressure and chemoreceptors primarily responding to the presence of acid. And that's what actually stimulates that sympathetic activity. And that sympathetic activity should also promote a release of our neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitters should allow us to respond to the sympathetic activity. But when you have to administer norepinephrine or epinephrine, you should be thinking about adrenal insufficiency. Okay. So always really important to remind ourselves how different the endocrine system is from the nervous system, because this is really a chemical communicator and it's communication through the serum from a series of glands that are located throughout the body. And always important to remember that the pituitary really is the organ that is responsible for direction of the thyroid gland, the adrenal gland, and the pituitary gland, of course, also releases vasopressin. So uh, very in a very straightforward way, if you know that you have pituitary dysfunction, you have a you have a brain injury that has promoted some compression on the pituitary gland. You have a space occupying tumor that has affected pituitary function. You have a pituitary tumor. You're always going to expect that there's some significant issue with the adrenal glands. But what's really important, and really as it relates almost, almost particularly to hyperinflammatory states like sepsis, is that you can see some primary uh, pituitary dysfunction that is not about actual destruction of the pituitary gland, but just straightforward inflammatory response. Again, our purpose here is not to differentiate, although we could, between the pituitary and the adrenal gland, who's the cause of failure. Our purpose is to really look at the role of what it is the adrenal gland releases in the maintenance and survival of our critical patient. Always important also to remember that uh, endocrinology primarily works on a negative feedback loop. That means that on um, when the hormones are concentrated and they are maintained at a constant level, when that hormone concentration rises, further production of the hormone is inhibited because the hormone has answered the cellular call. Help me, help me, help me. I need cortisol. Adrenal gland releases it. Once you answer the call, then you stop the production. All right, so that brings us to our adrenal glands. And this is such a lovely picture here 
where you're looking at the kidneys and you're seeing the adrenal glands on the top of the kidneys and reminding ourselves of that physiologic anatomic relationship. Very important to us just in terms of when we're looking at individuals who have injury and who have motor vehicle collision, who have ruptured kidney, who have a ruptured spleen, who have increased uh, abdominal pressures and all those effects that may occur that may actually impact adrenal function. So again, the adrenal glands are located on top of each kidney and they are divided into two parts, the cortex and the cortex is responsible for the glucocorticoid cortisol and the medulla. And the medulla is deep in the middle of the adrenal gland and the medulla is responsible for the release of the mineral corticoid aldosterone and your neurotransmitters, norepinephrine and epinephrine. So very, very important to remind ourselves that the medulla of the adrenal gland is absolutely essential in preparing your body for stress response. And that the adrenal cortex, and I'm so sorry because I said aldosterone from the medulla, but of course I meant aldosterone uh, and cortisol from the adrenal cortex. Those are the main hormones. So if we divide this, I'm not talking about androgen, androgeny hormones and other types of hormones, really just the ones we think about in critical care. Two hormones from the cortex, two neurotransmitters from the medulla, epi and norepi from the medulla, aldosterone and cortisol from the adrenal cortex. Now, that, that right away says to us, huh, maybe I should always be thinking that I have some adrenal insufficiency if my patient has refractory hypotension because they may not have enough norepinephrine or epinephrine and I'm titrating up, but they're not really responding very well. There might be other reasons, but it definitely is something that we wanna consider when we're evaluating our patients. And most of us spend an extraordinary amount of time trying to get our patient's blood pressure up with volume and vasopressors, sometimes inotropin, sometimes other vasopressors. Okay, so really, really important to remind ourselves these steroid hormones are really significant and only two of them, there's, there's about 30 of them, but only two of them are really important to us in critical care. First is aldosterone, and what aldosterone does is it controls salt and potassium exchange. So sodium and potassium exchange and water reabsorption, okay, at the kidney. So one of the things that I always say that's really important for you to think about because you're drawing those labs, you're looking at that first pass on your chemistry, and you're communicating with your physicians. You should always look at sodium and potassium together. If they're both down, if they're both up, or if they're in opposing directions. Typically, when you see them in opposing directions, you should start thinking about whether or not we may have some adrenal dysfunction because that mineral corticoid, which promotes the reabsorption of sodium, if you have adrenal insufficiency, you're going to waste sodium, your sodium is going to drop, but your potassium is going to go up. So sodium down, potassium up is going to be a clue for you. Cortisol, the glucocorticoid, does so many things. But one of the major aspects of cortisol is to promote gluconeogenesis and the level of your circulating blood glucose. Now, what we also want to remind ourselves, and it's such an incredibly important component, all of the uh, studies in the past 20 years looking at refractory hypotension, particularly as it evolved out of sepsis, was looking at the role of cortisol as an what we call an oxy scavenger or an oxy, uh, a nitric oxide scavenger, um, a nitric oxide suppressor. So very, very important you don't have to know everything about the cellular wall and the endothelium. Certainly I don't, I'm no endotheliologist, but I want to remind you that locally your vessel will release in physiologic stress when it's hyperinflamed and hyperstimulated, will release something called nitric oxide synthase. And what that does is it promotes the relaxation of your endothelium. And what that means is 
your arteries will dilate. Okay, so cortisol suppresses that. You have to have enough cortisol to help control that nitric oxide synthase. And if you have adrenal insufficiency, what we're gonna see is unopposed local vasodilation, which means to you refractory hypotension. Okay, so my patient has hypotension. I've given volume to volume response. No longer is the patient volume responsive. Now I've transferred and transitioned over to neurotransmitters, norepinephrine and epinephrine, and I'm titrating up and I'm, I'm wondering why is it when I'm giving them supra normal neurotransmitters. I'm on 20 of norepinephrine and eight or 10 of epinephrine. The patient's not responding. I should be thinking this patient may have adrenal failure. If they have adrenal failure, what that may mean is their local tone of their arterioles are managed by nitric oxide synthase or the end result nitric oxide, which is an endothelial relaxant, which promotes vasodilation. Okay. Do you need to actually repeat all that or pass a test? Where is it going to ask you that question? No. What you need to know is that when you're at the bedside titrating up norepinephrine and epinephrine, your patient's not responding, something is wrong. More norepinephrine and more epinephrine probably won't make the situation better. And in general, you know, that's true. You go up, 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 and your patient's not responding. So you really have to, in your mind, on the day that you're caring for that patient, say, here is my limit. At that point, I'm calling my primary physician, the team, to say, I have titrated upwards and the patient's not responding. What is next, right? Not just keep giving the same, but the patient's not responding to. Now I've got to think, do I have adrenal failure? Do I have adrenal insufficiency relative to this situation? And, and, and there are other things as well. One of them would be uh, refractory metabolic acidosis, which promotes the loss of vasculotone as well. I mean, you've got to think about these things. You're the bedside nurse. You are the eyes, the ears, and the connected thought to your providers to assure that they get the right information. So just because you can titrate, 20 times what you started with doesn't mean that you should. I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm saying that when you're titrating up, you need to be having communications about what else we can add instead of just going up on the same medication that the patient's not responding to. And I think one of the very first things to talk about is whether or not our patient has critical illness, adrenal insufficiency. Okay, so just reminding ourselves, and we talk about that particularly about the cortisol. Cortisol, first and foremost, is going to promote gluconeogenesis. That means a you may have some ketosis and your glucose should go up. So when we get patients like back from the OR, <clears throat> open heart patients, CTS patients, as we call them, cardiothoracic surgical patients, they always come back on epinephrine. They're almost always mildly to moderately hyperglycemic. They're almost mildly to moderately ketotic, and that's partially because of the epinephrine, which is also promoting some release of the cortisol. So they often are in an increased rate of gluconeogenesis. They have some ketosis. They have hyperglycemia. We give them insulin to try to uh, assist them with moving glucose into the cell and reducing the production of ketones. And it's really important to look at how these hormones are affecting our patient. Again, I'm not really too worried about your androgenic hormones. I'm not worried at this moment in the critical care unit about your female or male sex organs. I'm not really worried about that. I'm much more worried about the role of epinephrine, cortisol, and aldosterone. Remember, epinephrine from the medulla, cortisol, and aldosterone from the cortex. And reminding myself that what I'm going to look at is sodium and potassium and water, glucose, and responsiveness to my neurotransmitters. Well, that's pretty straightforward. Sodium, potassium, and water, aldosterone, glucose, cortisol, and 
the response to my neurotransmitters, not just epinephrine, but norepinephrine from the adrenal medulla, the effect on the heart, the effect on the vascular uh, surface, uh, the effect on the liver. Okay. Now that mineral corticoid, aldosterone, always really important to remember that aldosterone, uh, although uh, it has some similar properties, it is primarily about regulation of fluid and electrolyte. Aldosterone stimulates the reabsorption of sodium. Following sodium will be chloride and following sodium will be water. So when I reabsorb sodium, I reabsorb water ultimately. Now that makes perfect sense to us because we know that when we have patients with renal dysfunction, we want them to waste salt and waste water. And when they waste salt and they waste water, they will exchange that sodium for potassium. So lots of times we'll talk in cardiology, especially about potassium sparing diuretics. Well, that would be aldactone or spirolactone, the other name for that. That actually promotes the wasting of sodium and the reabsorption of potassium. So in the normal process, in our normal process, when we release aldosterone, we'll reabsorb sodium and we'll waste potassium. When we no longer release aldosterone or the kidney can no longer respond to aldosterone, what we're gonna see is a complete, a complete reversal. Okay. And so that's really important. If I, if I can't respond to aldosterone, I'm just going to retain all that sodium and all that water and potassium is going to be affected for other reasons. Okay. Now aldosterone is under the basic control of the renin angiotensin system. And that's a really important system in terms of regulation of the adrenal gland, regulation of the adrenal hormones. And it's a really important system when we talk about how that affects the kidney. So just remind yourself that whenever your pressure goes down, your baroreceptors are going to communicate to your hypothalamic region through the medulla oblongata and increase sympathetic activity. And your kidney itself, from a small little apparatus known as the JG apparatus right at the glomerulus, is going to release the hormone renin. Renin actually uh, communicates with the hormone release from the kidney, uh, from the liver, that's angiotensinogen. And those two together become angiotensin one. Angiotensin one travels in the blood to the lung where a converting enzyme is applied to actually transpose that or activate it into angiotensin two. And angiotensin two now will promote the release of aldosterone, which will cause kidney retention of salt and water, and angiotensin II, the most potent vasoconstrictor known to man, will stimulate enhanced vascular tone. Now, my purpose today is not to talk about angiotensin, but to talk about angiotensin and its, uh, its regulation, really, of aldosterone, which is an adrenal gland, uh, adrenal gland output that acts at the kidney. So angiotensin promotes that release of aldosterone. Aldosterone goes and acts at the kidney. But the kidney has a lot of responsibility in starting this cascade of events because renin convert to angiotensin, ultimately angiotensin II, which stimulates the release of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. And aldosterone promotes salt and water reabsorption. Okay, so that's a, that's a really incredibly important thing. Sodium and water get reabsorbed, but they get reabsorbed equally. So typically you're not gonna see hyponatremia, salt diluted in water. What you typically are gonna see when you have hypoaldosteronism is that you're gonna waste a lot of salt and you're gonna retain a lot of potassium. So with hypoaldosteronism, a sign of adrenal insufficiency, your serum sodium goes down. Remember, whenever you see serum sodium is low, immediately look at potassium. If sodium is low and potassium is high, you must entertain that this is an aldosterone problem. Sodium low, potassium high, you must entertain that this is an aldosterone problem. It, it could not be, but in all likelihood, it's some level of adrenal insufficiency. Now, the other aspect, which I just, I've talked about before, just really important. This is just in uh, 
animals in an animal lab who were hemorrhaged and looking at in a, a block to uh, the renin angiotensin system using ACE inhibition, look at what you're able to do when you're hemorrhaged, how you're able to maintain your arterial blood pressure as long as you have a functional renin angiotensin system. And without a functional renin angiotensin system, you can't really maintain your blood pressure. So this, of course, is your mean arterial pressure. That's what we're really looking at here is even with hemorrhaging, if you've released that, I'm sorry, it's your systolic pressure. Uh, if you've released that renin and it converts to angiotensin aldosterone, you're able to maintain your pressure. And without it, you can't. Now that's, I want you to really think about this because when we're talking about patients. This is all so intimately related, right? Trying about a critical patient who has adrenal insufficiency, but they don't have Addison's disease and we're not really looking at their adrenal gland, but we are seeing that they've got some renal dysfunction. We've put them on CRT. Now that we're bypassing really a significant portion of kidney function, some of the kidney is still being perfused, but we may have a significant reduction in the release of renin and the conversion of renin to ultimately to angiotensin and the stimulation of aldosterone. You're going to see all those secondary effects that occur. I know it, uh, I, I hope it doesn't seem complex. When I hear the words coming out of my mouth, I'm like, this sounds so complicated, but it really isn't. It's just a cascade of events that aren't really present at the surface. Blood pressure is present at the surface. Heart rate is present at the surface. Even STEMI is present at the surface. But adrenal insufficiency in critical illness requires investigation. And it isn't so present. So the first thing I've said is when sodium is down and potassium is up, consider that that might be hypoaldosteronism and that may be part of adrenal insufficiency. Okay, that's all. Sodium down, potassium up, critical patient, refractory hypotension. Sodium down, potassium up, critical patient, refractory hypotension. The other thing we can add to that is, and that one, this one's a little more iffy, and that would be relative hypoglycemia, which means if you're on norepinephrine, epinephrine, you should be hyperglycemic. You're normal glycemic and you're on epi and norepi, something's wrong. Something's wrong. So you're always going to look at relative hypoglycemia. That's going to be secondary to that uh, adrenal insufficiency and hypocortisol. Okay. So again, when we think about adrenal disorders, we talk about insufficiency, that's Addison's disease, excess, that's Cushing syndrome. Neither one of those are the things we're talking about today. Today, we're talking about critical illness, adrenal insufficiency. Okay. Now that insufficiency can be due to destruction of pituitary or inflammation of the pituitary, destruction or dysfunction or inflammation of the adrenal cortex, or the adrenal and, and the adrenal medulla, or it just can be due to overwhelming demand consumption. So really, really important for us to think about this in a much bigger context. When we communicate to our doc saying, you know, it appears the patient may have some adrenal insufficiency. I'm really going to be talking about cortical hormones, aldosterone and glucocorticoid. But I also want you to have a trigger that when you're titrating up on your neurotransmitters, your vasopressors, I want that to trigger in your mind that you might need to look at adrenal function. Okay, so we've already said this. So when your corticosteroids go down, right? Uh, lots of, of errors gonna occur, but for us, what's gonna be the most important thing is we're gonna see a relatively low blood sugar and the possibility of refractory hypotension. When you have a decreased mineral corticoid, what you're gonna see typically is early on, there may be some water wasting, there's also going to be salt wasting. Now, by the time you see the patient, they may not be wasting much water because they may now have some renal dysfunction. But even if they're just making small amounts of urine, what you'll see in the urine is that they're wasting a lot of salt. The salt will be greater than 20 milliequivalents in the urine, but the sodium in the serum will be typically less than 135 or 130. They may be profoundly hyponatremic or just mildly hyponatremic. And remember, as they waste sodium, 
potassium will go up. So sodium down, potassium up. These are pretty simple clues. Relatively low blood sugar for your situation. Relatively low salt with higher potassium. Then it doesn't have to be a potassium of six. It just means sodium is down, potassium is up. So sodium might be 133 and potassium is 4.8. That's always going to trigger a consideration that this may be a symptom of acute adrenal insufficiency. Problem is that when we don't recognize this, it really is linked to high mortality, somewhere close to 80% mortality, because as a patient is exhibiting adrenal insufficiency, if we're not paying attention, they will just continue to decompensate. And we're at the bedside titrating up, epi, norepi, epi, norepi, vasopressin on, epi, norepi, epi, norepi, another liter, two more liters, four more liters, epi, norepi. Instead of stopping and saying, okay, something is wrong. My patient's not responding. Should I be thinking about adrenal insufficiency? Now, does that mean it's going to be a cure-all? No. Does it mean it's going to give an opportunity to some proportion of your patients to actually have some significant responsiveness when you've intervened? Yes. And literature tells us, evidence tells us, big studies, historically, it's been about 50-50, 50% of patients respond, 50% of patients don't. So your providers may be, well, I don't really want to try that. It might not really help. Let's wait. Let's keep going up on the vasopressors. Let's see what else is going on. Let's draw a spot cortisol. Let's do a corticotropin stim test and might say all sorts of things. But all the newer evidence is saying, if you have refractory hypotension and you're using neurotransmitters and your patient's not responding, you should, you should be replacing your patient. Okay, that's what the new evidence says. So that means that's a new armamentarium. So again, I'm going to I'm going to suspect adrenal crisis with refractory hypotension with relative. Now make sure you understand. I'm not saying your patient's 60, blood glucose of 60. I'm saying you're on high dose nori epi, you're on high dose epi and your patient has a normal blood sugar. That is not Correct. They should always be high. You should have had to add insulin. You didn't have to add insulin. That's a relative hypoglycemia. So it's a relative hypoglycemia to the contextual situation and a relative potassium that's elevated with a relative hyponatremia. Studies have reported that in septic shock in patients who never had any type of adrenal dysfunction, no adrenal disorder, Adrenal insufficiency is as high as 60, per, almost 60%. That means 60% of patients under your care who have septic shock, who are requiring volume and vasopressors have adrenal insufficiency, which means let's not wait three days. As soon as we're seeing that they're not responsive, we should be thinking about administration of corticosteroids. So we have three types of adrenal insufficiency. Primary means that it's at the adrenal glands. Secondary means it's pituitary mediated. And tertiary means it's hypothalamic mediated. So primary is always the organ that releases the hormone. Secondary is the pituitary gland, which controls that organ. And the hypothalamus, which controls the pituitary gland is tertiary. Okay, we're not, we don't care about any of that. We really just don't care. What we really care about is that our patient is prominently hypotensive and he is prominently hypoglycemic. Typically, they don't really look dehydrated, but almost always they will have mild to moderate hyponatremia and mild to moderate hyperkalemia. Here's the key. Same thing I've said. I'm going to say it again and again and again and again. Unexplained vasopressor resistant hypotension. Okay. By the way, what the heck do I mean by that? What I mean by that is when you add neurotransmitters and you're titrating up, your patient should respond. Okay. So when they're not responsive, that's an unexplained vasopressor resistant hypotension. Right away, we should be talking about would my patient have a benefit to the administration of cortisol and fludrocortisone, which is the mineral corticoid hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, lethargy, anemia, and relative hypoglycemia. This is not a lot to remember here. Sodium is down, potassium is up, glucose is down, blood pressure is down, and resistant. 
pretty straightforward. So sometimes folks want to do a diagnosis for adrenal insufficiency, but by the way, if I give you 100 milligrams of cortisol and within an hour your blood pressure comes up and your glucose comes up, I don't need anything else. I already know I've made a diagnosis. I gave you cortisol and you responded. So intervention is really the diagnosis, but sometimes folks want to do adrenocorticotropin uh, stimulation. Uh, all the evidence and everything in critical care says you do not need to do that. You don't need to stimulate the adrenal gland. Just give steroids. And it's small. I mean, it's a relatively small dose, not a gram. It's 100 milligrams. I'm going to give you an, an IV bolus, and I'm going to give you about an hour to respond. Sometimes patients respond immediately. What I've seen sometimes is when we've administered 100 milligrams of cytokortep, the blood pressure bumps up almost immediately, the glucose comes up, and the urine output goes up. And the urine output goes up because you have a better pressure flow gradient from the responsiveness to the corticosteroid. Okay, but if folks want to do a corticotropin stim test, remember you draw a spot cortisol, you stimulate the adrenal gland with ACTH, and then you measure the cortisol level an hour later. And if the cortisol level goes, uh, actually raises above 18 or 20, now we kind of say 20 micrograms per deciliter, the likelihood is that you do not have adrenal insufficiency. Now, some folks have debunked that because they say, well, you don't really know how high your cortisol level has to be for you to survive critical care or critical illness. What has been well studied is that looking at patients who survive uh, vasopressor resistant hypotension and shock to patients who don't survive is that their baseline cortisols were higher and that the patients who survived oftentimes had baseline cortisol levels that were extraordinarily high, like 20, 25, 30. So we don't really know to what level your cortisol should be in order for you to survive your critical illness. And that's why most, most folks who are up on evidence and are reading about this and maybe aren't hanging on to something that might be a little bit older. That's why most folks say, yeah, don't do a corticotropin stem test, right? Really, you're just saying, I'm making this based on the clinical presentation, classic signs of circulatory shock with refractory hypotension. If the patient is awake and alert, they may be very apprehensive. They may tell me they're going to die. If they're intubated and they're already critically ill, they've got signs of circulatory shock tachycardia, rapid respirations, and a very low blood pressure, all the definitions for shock. So when your patient looks like they're in shock, consider that it may be helpful for them to receive corticosteroid. Here's what the newer evidence says is, although when you just draw a spot cortisol, spot cortisol, not a stim cortisol, just a spot, if the circulating spot cortisol level is more than 20, the probability is you do not have adrenal insufficiency. So just your spot. If you do it in the morning, but your cortisol level in the morning is less than five, it actually does support adrenal insufficiency. So you might see that you may have docs who are saying, I want to look at what the adrenal gland is doing. I need you to draw this uh, spot cortisol at 4 a.m. Don't draw it in the afternoon because that's going to muddy up my diagnosis. I want you to draw it in the morning if they're even wanting you to draw a spot cortisol level. Okay, so really four things. I'm not saying in any necessary order. Okay, I'm just saying there are four things that have to happen immediately. Number one, you got to correct fluid and electrolyte imbalances. Now, first and foremost, you want to replete the, cort uh, the glucocorticoid cortisol. So that's the first thing you're going to want to do. And you're going to do that typically with what we call a stress dose. That's 100 milligrams. And you're going to see how the patient responds. And then you, your docs and your providers may make a choice. They may say, oh, if the patient responded within one hour to the 100 milligram IV push that we gave, we're going to give our patient 50 to 100 milligrams, Q6 to eight hours. Usually if you're doing Q8 hours, you're going to be at 100. If you're doing it Q6, you're going to be around 50 or 75 to kind of maintain your patient's circulating cortisol. Okay, now what you might also see 
And what, what I prefer, although I don't think we have actual evidence that tells us it's better or not, is that I want my patient to get continuous corticosteroids. So basically we say you're gonna give a total of 300 milligrams every 24 hours. So you're gonna give 300 milligrams in 500 cc's of fluid continuously over 24 hours. And by the way, you cannot let that bag run dry. You cannot let that run out. You cannot, if you're doing it intermittently, you cannot be late with administration because your patient is relying on that corticosteroid to do a couple of things. First of all, remember to facilitate our gluconeogenesis, but secondly, because the glucocorticoid in this state suppresses the production of a vasodilator known as nitric oxide synthase. You don't have to know that. You just have to say, I know that it reduces the production of a vasodilator locally that I cannot overcome with norepinephrine and epinephrine. I can't overcome it. I need that glucocorticoid to suppress that production. Okay, so I'm gonna start with that. So that was one and three married together. You're gonna to need to correct that hypoglycemia and depending on how significant it is, you'll use D5LR, D5 normal saline. You might give D10, you might even have to give D50, but that would only be if your patient was really hypoglycemic. But I took care of you yesterday. Yesterday, your glucose was 168, you're not on insulin you're intubated, you're not getting nutritional support. And today I come in and your norepinephrine, epinephrine have increased by four and your blood glucose is 90. Okay, that's a relative hypoglycemia. Okay, so I'm gonna give you some kind of glucose to actually bring your glucose levels up. And then I'm gonna give you corticosteroids that are gonna help you with your uh, manufacturing of, of glucose from non-glucose products. So really, really, really important to us when we're looking at this. Okay, now as the patient stabilizes, you will most likely taper off their glucocorticoids to a physiologic replacement, which will be oral. Um, and really, we're going to probably keep you on steroids. We may, we may wean you to physiologic replacement IV, but probably we're going to try to get you over to an oral agent. And the same with mineral corticoids. That's fludrocortisone is the mineral corticoid that we use. And once we've stabilized, you're going to take a look to see what other kinds of endocrine dysfunction you have. Because remember, if the problem was at your pituitary gland, you're going to have some other things like hypothyroidism. You may have some hypogonadism. Again, yeah, I work in critical care, so I'm not really thinking about that. And we're not looking at gonoidal development, although you could see gonoidal shrinkage when you have somebody who has this type of insufficiency. I'm not as worried about that myself. I am worried about whether or not you can survive. So you can't really survive if you have adrenal insufficiency. You can't really survive if you have critical care or critical care induced hypothyroidism, or if either one of those or both of those were undiagnosed before your critical illness. So you may have had something prior to your hospital visit that wasn't diagnosed. That would be much more common in the thyroid gland than it would be with the adrenal gland because adrenal insufficiency is... Uh, it's a it's a very difficult process to live with. In fact, I just want to show you something. So one of my colleagues, it's, it's going to be backwards, but I'm going to show you this little bag. This is from the primary adrenal insufficiency program. Oh, you probably can't see it. But anyway, uh, I showed you that bag because one of my colleagues who works here in trauma came to me and said, this is what's happening to my father. I said, oh, this sounds like adrenal insufficiency. And by the way, that's what it was. And he has chronic adrenal insufficiency, which means if he ever came into the hospital and you didn't pay attention to his alert bracelet, he will die unless you give him salutorca because physical illness, hyperinflammation causes an exacerbation of the demand for your cortisol. And if you're adrenally insufficient, you'll die. First thing for anyone who's adrenally insufficient is glucocorticoid, 100 milligrams Cytocortef. So those patients have it at home. Their family knows how to inject them. They know to give it. You have to know to give it. And the other thing you have to know is when to question. 
So again, remember, I've got somebody who has refractory hypotension with relative hypoglycemia, who likely is going to have a low sodium and a high potassium. Four things you have to remember. Four things. Oh, the one. Hi, guys. Remember to uh, mute, mute yourself, okay. please. Rose, Rose, you need to mute yourself. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm not, not listening, so I'm going to see if I can find her and mute her. I just recognize her voice. Yeah. Does it come with the grilled chicken? Yeah. Okay, yeah. The, yeah. How many? What did I have? Okay, I cannot find who is not muted, but someone is unmuted. So please mute uh, yourself. Remember, it's kind of disturbing. Okay, great. Thank you so much, guys. All right. So just wanted to share with you some of the recent data. So 2018, 2019, uh, defining the role of corticoid steroids in sepsis. And the conglomeration from both of these is that there is a compelling case for corticosteroids as an adjunctive agent conventional resuscitation when patients are in shock gives a much more significant reversal of shock and a reduction in organ dysfunction. Nobody knows actually how much, how bolus versus continuous, how long should it happen, like in the first four hours, should it happen in 12 hours, and do you actually have to taper? Those things have not been fully answered. What has been fully answered though, is that in critical illness, when patients present, Okay, so we're going to go through those four things again, right? Refractory hypotension, relative hypoglycemia, relative hyponatremia, relative hyperkalemia. So none of those have to be out of bounds profoundly. And you are titrating vasopressors and resuscitating from shock. You should always consider the possibility of critical illness, adrenal insufficiency, and request the possibility for administration of corticosteroids. And remember, it's a hundred milligram bolus. You have about an hour that I'm gonna evaluate your response. You might respond immediately, it might take a little bit longer. You have about an hour where I'm gonna evaluate that response. And if you respond, I am then going to place you on a, con uh, for me, it would be a continuous strip of 300 milligrams per day, but it's fine if you're doing Q6, Q8, that's pulse dosing, it's bolus dosing. The one problem I think with bolus dosing is you bolus and then you have decreasing activity. You bolus and you have decreasing activity. So it gives you corticosteroid variability, whereas more constant corticosteroid may achieve a better, uh, a better situation. Can't tell you that we know that for sure, but in the in the uh, early 2000s up through about 2012, 50-50 discussions. Yes, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. We don't really know. We don't know when to give it. People were giving it really late. Looking at the Quarkus trials, it did not actually show an improvement in mortality, but there was no control over the time that it was given. So again, what I'm saying to you is as you're titrating up, look at your glucose. If your glucose is coming down, if your sodium is low and your potassium is high, you should have a discussion with your providers, with your partners in health here, with your partners in wellness, you should have a discussion about whether or not there is a case for the utilization of corticosteroids. Are there other things we can do uh, not to replace cortisol? And the only thing that's going to replace cortisol is cortisol. But can I do other things that scavenge nitric oxide? Yes, methylene blue. Yes, I can do that. Can I just put you on a D10 drip or, or administer D50? Yes, I can do that. I can put you on insulin and give you D10 and try to control your ketosis. Those are all, those are all good things. I can also consider the administration of angiotensin II to try to reverse your shock and promote vascular tone. All of those things are beneficial, but corticosteroid is giving your patient something if they actually have adrenal insufficiency. And again, it's not just refractory hypotension. It's kind of the big four that we've talked about over and over and over again, the big four, refractory hypotension, 
relative hypoglycemia, relative hyponatremia, relative hyperkalemia. That's why also you want to remind yourself that just corticosteroids not enough. You also have to use a mineral corticoid. And again, the one that we use here, fludrocortisone. So we would use cortisol plus fludo, fludrocortisone. And sometimes if you give one agent that, uh, so solumetrol, that is much heavier on the uh, mineral corticoid side than it is on the glucocorticoid side. I, I personally prefer giving the two separate agents, but if I don't have that, then I just can give solumetrol. All right, my friends, I would say that that is it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining. And in summary, I always want you to remember unexplained hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, refractory hypotension, and relative hypoglycemia. Always, always, always consider the possibility of critical adrenal insufficiency. So always think about the hormones, not so evident, require investigation, but might make the difference between life and death for your patient. Thank you very much for sharing your afternoon with me. I'm so grateful that you attend, that you come so frequently, and I'm grateful to be part of this fantastic profession. And also, I'm really grateful to be part of my Grady family here. And I thank you all very much. I am now going to stop recording, but I will return so that if there are some questions, uh, we can have some good discussion. Okay.